Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this gathering this evening, this talk and a discussion with Sister Natalie Beckhardt on the theme, Women and Youth, the Driving Force of Synodality. I'm David Gibson. I'm the director at Fordham's Center on Religion and Culture. And we're very grateful, first of all, for our co-hosts uh, this, at this event, St. Paul the Apostle Church, a community that we're so pleased to uh, call our friends and our partners. And they take in, even though they're the Paulists, they take in we folks who identify with the Ignatian tradition and give us sanctuary quite often. So we're very glad for that ecumenical outreach. This event also relaunches our annual Russo Lecture Series which has been made possible by the Russo Family Foundation in memory of Wanda and Dr. Robert Russo Sr., a 1939 graduate of Fordham College, Rose Hill. We're especially grateful to uh, Robert Russo Jr., Bob Russo, who's here with us, who graduated from Fordham College, Rose Hill, sometime after 1939, well after 1939. But he's joined us here this evening, and he's, we thank him very much for his support throughout the years. We actually paused the Russo lectures during the pandemic, preferring really to wait out the virus. We did so much great programming, and you all were so supportive on Zoom. But we really wanted to gather together again to listen to wonderful speakers and to share our thoughts together. It's really critical, we believe, to building community and communion. And we're really pleased that so many of you have turned out this evening. So women, youth, and synodality. Our speaker this evening is the perfect person to help us understand the dynamic of this trinity, this, these three terms. And especially perhaps to understand that last word, synodality. It's a term that's so central to what is happening in the church today, and it's a term that also is hard to pronounce, <laughs> and it provokes a great deal of opposition, or maybe not a lot of opposition, but a very small and passionate opposition. And yet, have we really understood what the term means, even those of us who are dedicated to to synodality? Have we really experienced it? Sister Natalie has certainly has. She's a member of the French congregation of the Xavier Sisters. They were born out of, dedicated to Francis Xavier or stemming from the charism of Francis Xavier. So we share an Ignatian mission and outlook. Sister Natalie spent most of her career working with young people after graduating from France's leading business school, I might add. Uh, she worked with young people and in youth ministry for the Bishop's Conference of France. That led to her playing a role at the October 2018 Synod on Youth that was held in the Vatican under the aegis, as always, of Pope Francis. And indeed, a few months later, Pope Francis named her and three other woman, women and a man as consultors to the General Secretariat of the Synod of Bishops, part of the Roman Curia. It was the first time that a woman was appointed to that position in the Curia. Then in 2021, Pope Francis appointed her as an undersecretary of the Synod of Bishops, making her the first woman to have that, the right to vote in a synod and making her what was generally called the highest ranking woman in the Vatican. No wonder the New York Times called Sister Natalie the nun reshaping the role of women in the Vatican. And I'd certainly agree with that, but I also like to think of Sister Natalie as Pope Francis's global ambassador for synodality, for the goal of a genuine global communal renewal of Catholicism. In carrying out that mission on behalf of the Pope, Sister Natalie has a travel schedule that makes me exhausted just thinking about it. Uh, as we were setting this up, the exchange of emails from Natalie was 
you know, I'm in Sydney, I'm in, where was it, Oceania someplace, uh, I'm in Lebanon. Um, I wanted to go get my melatonin right then. So we're really pleased that she could um, take time to be with us this evening. Here's how the evening will go. Sister Natalie will speak for about 30 or 40 minutes. Then she will sit up here uh, with myself and we'll have a conversation with you all. So please get your questions ready. We'll have a, um, a handheld mic to go around and silence your cell phones, always. And we'll have wine and cheese afterwards. So over to you, Sister Natalie Beckar. Please join me in welcome. Yes, thank you so much, uh, David. Thank you so much, all of you. Good evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be back to New York after 26 years. So it has been a, a very long time. And uh, I am deeply honored and uh, delighted to be invited by Fordham. And uh, also, I'm impressed to be in this uh, big police church. When I spent a few months in Chicago uh, for sabbatical time, I discovered the police father and went to sing in a choir at the police parish. Uh, so I feel some connection. And uh, the first time I discovered New York, in fact, was with my grand aunt was a New Yorker because my grand uncle who was French came here and married a New Yorker. So I feel a little bit connected <laughs> with you here. And uh, I will try to, to share. Uh, some thought about uh, women and youth, the driving force of synodality, as we are all together already leaving this synod opened by Pope Francis in October 2021. And um, it's a call to continue the synodal journey. And it's very nice to journey with you tonight as we are all together uh, experiences this synod on synodality. So my focus will be on women and youth because we can see all over the world, and it's true, I come back, I come here after uh, attending to four continental meetings, uh, continental synodal meetings, so in Oceania, Middle East, Asia, and Africa. And everywhere I think in the world, we can see that young people want to change the world for a better world, women also, and they also want to help the church uh, to better serve uh, the society and, uh, and the people. But the first thing, when we think about synodality, what is a synodal church? And Pope Francis is uh, repeating that over and over a synodal church is a listening church. So if we really want to discover what is synodality, the best thing is that I listen to you. Uh, and I would like to propose uh, to introduce this time together to have also a synodal style that we take one minute in silence and I will invite each of you just to think when you think about your own experience of synodality, churning together, your experience maybe of the synod or your reflection uh, on synodality, what word or what image comes to you? So I invite you to take one minute in silence and to think about your experience or reflection on synodality, maybe connected to women and youth, and just let come one word or one image, so one minute in silence. And now I invite you to share two by two with your neighbor, two by two to share this word or image that came to you when you think about synodality. So two minutes, two by two.
So I invite you to conclude. You know, when we speak about a synodal church, as I said, it's a listening church, and it's about first listening also to the, to the word of God, to each other, and it means also a learning church. So there is not someone here who knows everything on synodality, and you know we can learn from each other. And I quote Pope Francis, a synodal church is a church which listens, which realizes that listening is more than simply hearing. It is a mutual listening in which everyone has something to learn. The faithful people, the College of Bishops, the Bishop of Rome, all listening to each other and all listening to the Holy Spirit. So the Synod of Bishops is the point of convergence of this listening process conducted at every level of the church life. And really the scope, we can say, of this Synod, the goal is to become more and more this Synodal Church that is a listening church in which we have to learn from one another and in which we put at the center the principle of the participation of all in the life of the church. So when we speak about the participation of all, all the baptized, of course, it means the women and the youth, like uh, all of us. And uh, I quote uh, an important document on synodality, uh, drafted by the International Commission on Theology about synodality in the life and mission of the church. So I quote, synodality means that the whole church is a subject and that everyone in the church is a subject. The faithful are companions on the journey. They are called to play an active role in as much as they share in the one priesthood of Christ and are meant to receive the various charisms given by the Holy Spirit in view of the common good. So it's about speaking about a synodal church, synodality. It's about speaking of a participatory and co-responsible church one capable of appreciating its own rich variety, gratefully accepting the contributions of the less full, including young people and women, consecutive persons, as well as groups, associations, and movements. No one should be excluded or exclude themselves. It's Pope Francis in Christus Vivit, the post synodal exhortation after the synodal news. So, I hope that this short introduction highlights that women and youth already are part and are called to be part of synodality, but more than that, they are driving force of synodality. So my talk will be in two parts. After trying to highlight a little bit more about what is synodality, I would like to uh, explain from the experience on the Synod on Youth and then the Synod on the Amazon, and I had the chance to be part of those two synods, to explain why uh, we have seen that women and youth are driving force of synodality. And then through the experience of this synod, 21-24, for a synodal church communion participation mission, I would like to highlight in my second part why synodality can be considered as a process to empower women and youth. So what is synodality? I think the first important thing is to have in mind that synodality is a call of God. It is the call of God for the church in the third millennium. And I quote Pope Francis again in one of his uh, main uh, the, the, the most important uh, speech of his pontificate, the address at uh, the ceremony commemorating the 50th anniversary of the institution of the Synod of Bishops, October 17, 2015, Pope Francis says, the world in which we live and which we are called to love and serve, even with its contradictions, demands that the church strengthen cooperation in all areas of our mission. It is precisely this path of synodality which God expects of the church of the third millennium. And I quote another uh, uh, passage of Pope Francis in an interview. He says, 
synodality is the way of being the church today according to the will of God in a dynamic of discerning and listening together to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So it's not about, I like it, I don't like it, I want to do it, I don't want to do it. It's about answering the call of God, the will of God for the church in the third millennium to continue to be the same missionary church from the beginning, but in this context in uh, the world in which we are living. And to understand better what we have to do, <laughs> I quote a theologian from Australia, Orman Rush, in a very short quote that I think is very powerful. He says, synodality is the Council Vatican II in a nutshell. Synodality is the Council Vatican II in a nutshell. So what we are doing, what we are called to do, is really to continue the reception of the Second Vatican Council and to implement the vision of the Church coming from the Second Vatican Council. And we can understand synodality really as uh, this vision, this way to designate the Church with this pilgrim style of the Church of Christ as she journeys through history. Synodality is a dynamic vision of the Church in history. It's not a theoretical, idealistic uh, vision of the Church in uh, the sky. It's about being the Church of people of God, all baptized, journeying in history in New York, in this archdiocese, in the United States, in Lebanon, in uh, China. So it points out the path that the people of God travels uh, as people among all the people of the earth. So it's about discerning the signs of the time, understanding the world in which we are living and in which we are called to proclaim the gospel. And you know, we are in a very fast changing world. And after the pandemic, so many things change. So we have to interpret the sign of the time. And when we try to understand this world, we can really understand that from everywhere, there is a change in the culture of the young people and more and more young people, uh, you know, today, they are at the front line <laughs> of uh, the change in our society. Uh, we can think about their sensibility for uh, ecology, facing uh, the challenge of climate change. And from all over the world, we hear that in a way it's the power of the women because there is a strong call for more uh, women e equality, uh, gender equality, we can say, and uh, women participation in the society and in the church. So to conclude, I would like to highlight the key elements at the basis of the ecclesiology of synodality, that means the vision uh, from Vatican II of what is the church. And uh, if you want to deepen that, you can at the end, I think, uh, take the books that are here. It's uh, Orbis book has just published, Walking Together, that is a kind of compendium of all Pope Francis speech and document on synodality. And in my introduction, I highlight those key elements. So it's about living, experiencing the church as people of God on the way with this dynamic vision of the church, putting a focus and deepening the theology of baptism. So uh, young people and women are, um, when they are baptized, you know, they, they are really a true member of the people of God. Putting the action of the Holy Spirit at the center and uh, retrieving what we call the authority of the sense of faith of all the faithful. So even the kids, the young people, and all uh, the baptized men and women uh, are uh, embodied, we can say, uh, can be enlightened by the Holy Spirit. 
And uh, it's really about, as I said, uh, highlighting the diversity of the charisms. And the last point that is very important is the vision of a synodal church is a vision of a relational church based on the, a relational anthropology. And we can see that maybe many young people and most of the women, they carry this sensitivity and this attention to a relationship. During the Synod on Young People, especially at the pre-Synod on Youth, there were 300 young people from all over the world, and I spent one week with them. Pope Francis opened this uh, pre-Synod on Youth, and we have uh, really understood that what young people ask the church is mainly to be a relational church. They don't want the church as an institution, just a structure. They want a relational church. Uh, and they, they, it's about, and we know in, in the pastoral, uh, it's about the quality of relationship. And Pope Francis is really expressing that uh, putting this focus on of the importance of welcoming, dialogue, listening to each other, and building a relationship. So, to uh, try to draw from all of that, I would like to highlight that synodality is about this dynamic vision of the church. That means it calls us to be a church on the move a church that is in an ongoing discernment, discerning day after day in each context how to proclaim the gospel, not in the Middle Age, not in the 18th century, but today uh, in, in this world. And when, why maybe young people have a kind of resonance with this uh, dynamic vision of a synodal church, it's uh, uh, because when we think about young people, and Pope Francis was asked, what image do you have in mind when you think about young people? And he highlighted that for him, he see young people, a young boy or girl, with an agile foot looking for his way, entering the world and looking at the horizons with hopeful eyes, full of future and also illusions. He highlights, to understand a young person today, you have to understand them in movement. The young people are those who are. So to be a church with the young people, and that's exactly what I have learned during 30 years in youth ministry, campus ministry, with so many young people, uh, and I think many of those who are at the university know that, you need to be on the move. And uh, you must, as, as uh, Pope Francis says, it's powerful, you cannot sit still and pretend that you are on the same wavelength if you want to dialogue with a young person, you must be mobile. And he says that young people and old people have to talk to each other. So it's about churning with the young people. They will carry this charism, we can say, of helping the church to uh, see herself with this dynamic identity moving forward and uh, understanding that young people are not only the future of the church, like we say sometimes, no, they are the present. They are already there. And even during the synod, we uh, many dioceses and others have done the synodal consultation and listening session with kids. It can be beautiful what they say. The Holy Spirit speaks through them and also like, uh, like young people. So if we want to understand young people, and so if we want to be a church for now and the future, we have to move and to be with young people. And to understand better young people, I would like to give you uh, four letters that help us to understand what I call the postmodern digital culture of young people. And all over the world, 
I have under, uh, listened to the concern of so many. The young people are not there in, our, in the pew on the, during many masses, or it's difficult to reach them, how to be a church, to reach and be with young people. So we have to understand their culture. So I give you four uh, uh, letters. E, like experience. Young people, they learn by doing. And it's exactly synodality. I can talk three hours about synodality, but I do speech when I am asked, but it's not enough. It's just we can only discover really what is synodality through an experience. It's a learning by doing because it's learning to discern the call of the Holy Spirit and it's about the, the lively life of the Spirit. So we can't uh, put that or learn that in a book or a beautiful academic course. And young people, what they want, it's not just a theoretical proposal of what is the church or what is the faith. They need to experience it and to experience the encounter with Christ. So second letter, that is at the center of synodality and at the center of the culture of young people today, it's participation. Participation, they need to participate. So, so third letter, image, because young people more and more, they have uh, the culture, there is a culture of music, image, uh, video, and we need to speak those new languages and connection. So I will conclude this part highlighting uh, some key outcomes that came from the Synod on Youth that explain why they really want a synodal church. And that's exactly what we have understood through the listening of the young people at the Synod on Youth. And in a way, uh, what I have understood through all my years of youth ministry. Because first, young people want to be heard. They want to be listened to. Second, young people want to be protagonists. They want to participate. But they also need guidance and they need accompaniment. They need mentors, uh, spiritual guides, uh, role models, but not people like a teacher teaching from above but companions on their journey, walking with them like Jesus Christ on the road of Emmaus. And becoming a synodal church, the best image is uh, the image of Jesus Christ on the road of Emmaus. He's walking with the two disciples where they are, even in a wrong way. <laughs> he begins to listen to them, their disillusion, what they have experienced, then he explains the scriptures. Then he doesn't impose himself, but he, uh, he highlights something deep in them and the disciples ask him, stay with us. And they experience uh, a meal together that is a figure of the Eucharist. And then the disciples go back to Jerusalem, they are reintegrated in the community and sent forth for mission. So they have experienced a synodal conversion. So uh, young people, they are really engines of synodality. We have understood that through the synod on youth because they dream and they want, as I said, not an institutional church, but a church as a family with this style of fraternity that is a church of brothers and sisters in Christ, all together journeying, whereas we are uh, men or women, priests, bishops, sisters, or lay people, first, and that's the core of synodality, first, we are all together baptized before all our differences of vocation. So the, a synodal church really needs uh, young people because we can learn a lot from them. And they are those who will help the church 
and who already helped the church to become synodal. Because through the synodal use, we have uh, uh, particularly uh, being, became aware that the young people are longing, what they ask the church is to be an authentic church, a coherent church, and a relational church that is a synodal church. So uh, we have understood that to transmit the faith today, there is no other way that to be a synodal church with this style of co-responsibility and participation. So in a way, the participation of the young people help to reawaken synodality, which is this constitutive element uh, of the church. And listening to the youth, and I, from the beginning, when you listen to young people today, they will speak about women and they will call for more participation uh, of women in leadership in decision-making in the church. So uh, I quote the final document of the Synod on Youth, a paragraph called Women in a Synodal Church. A church that seeks to live a synodal style cannot fail to reflect on the condition and role of women within it and consequently in society more generally. Young men and women ask this question forcefully. A sphere of particular importance in this regard is the female presence in ecclesial bodies at all levels, including position of responsibility, as well as female participation in ecclesial decision-making processes. This is a duty of justice. And Pope Francis uh, took that in Christus Vivit. That was the Synod on Youth. Then the Synod on the Amazon, in a way, has deepened what came from the Synod on Youth, the call to foster and implement a missionary synodality, uh, calling for the participation of all. And at the Synod on the Amazon, uh, the women, who were 10% of uh, the participants uh, in the assembly in Rome in October 2019, have played a, a very important role. And the experience of the Amazon region and with many communities, uh, you know, in this big uh, Amazon forest, has highlighted that I quote uh, the post-synodal exhortation Querida Amazona, the strengths and gift of women. For centuries, women have kept the church alive in those places through their remarkable devotion and deep faith. Some of them speaking at the synod moved us profoundly by their testimony. So it's Pope Francis who has written that. And in the final document of the Synod uh, on the Amazon, there was this uh, strong light on the importance uh, to foster women's place in leadership and formation, and also a call uh, to uh, involve women and to have instituted uh, ministry for women. And Pope Francis has done that with uh, the institution of lectorate and acolyte, not only for men, but also for women, and also the ministry of uh, catechist, catechist. So I'm now in my second part. Synodality as a process to empower women and youth. And through this synod at all levels, we have seen that. At the beginning of the Synod, the General Secretary of the Synod to involve all the dioceses, bishops' conference, to have this broad consultation of uh, all the batailles, but not only the batailles, we have also invited to listen to questions from different denominations, people from other faiths who want uh, to say something to the church. 
we have uh, given the suggestion that each diocese and each bishop's conference uh, have a synod coordinator, synod referent, but preferably a team, if possible with a co-leadership, men and women, and a team with different vocations, including young people and uh, women. And many, many have done that. And in the United States, we have women, sisters, as coordinator of diocesan team. In the national team of the USCCB that has done a wonderful work to promote and accompany uh, the synod uh, in the United States, uh, there are two. Uh, and it's a very young woman and uh, a lay man that is uh, older. So we can see how uh, in different ways, synodality is a process of empowerment for all people of God to achieve co-responsibility and that uh, especially laity and many, many women, uh, of course, are among the lay people, even if there are also some uh, consecrated uh, women. <clears throat> but uh, what we see, and we have highlighted from the beginning in the preparatory document of the Synod, that was a kind of roadmap for the Synodal consultation, we have highlighted the need to uh, really listen to, to everybody, especially women and young people. Also, because we have, and, and that's really what Pope Francis asked the church, to be a church to go to the periphery, to listen especially to those who have no voice, to the poorest, and everywhere in the world, the first victims of violence, of wars, of unemployment, of are the women and the young people. Um, so if we are called to be a church really serving and uh, trying to be uh, as, an, uh, as this hospital uh, for all and a merciful church, we need to have a special attention to uh, women and young people. And through the Synod, and I quote the working document for the continental states, that is a kind of uh, result synthesis, giving echoes of all the Synodal uh, consultation all over the world. We, uh, I quote, the reports clearly show that many communities have already understood Synodality as an invitation to listen to those who feel exiled from the church. The groups who feel a sense of exile are diverse, beginning with many women and young people who do not feel their gifts and abilities are recognized. And through this synod, many, many of them, and I have wonderful stories from different parts of the world, have said, you know, it's the first time the church is really asking my voice and giving my voice as a young people, as a woman, as uh, someone from a feeling very marginalized, I realize that the church is not only the bishops and the priests, but um, all of us. So I quote uh, a little bit later this document. There is a universal concern regarding the low presence of the voice of young people in the synod process, as well as increasingly in the life of the church. A renewed focus on young people, their formation and accompaniment is an urgent need, also a way to implement the conclusions of the previous synod on young people. Uh, so if you want to be a church with young people, and then you will be a church with women, just read and put into practice Christus Vivit. It's a very good roadmap. As a way uh, to listen better to young people, because we know that when we do the synodal consultation through uh, parish or many institutions, it's sometimes difficult to really reach and listen to young people, but also fortunately many universities have done the synodal process or Catholic school. 
but with the Dicastery for Communication, we have uh, organized a very interesting initiative called the Digital Synod to listen to young people. And many, many uh, bringing with us influencers, we have been able uh, to listen to many young people uh, from the digital continent where they are most of the time or quite part of the time. So I want to quote uh, the main results of this listening to young people from the digital synod because I think it's also very interesting. What they ask, what they want for the church is orientation in the face of a confusing and rapidly changing reality. And for them, the figure of the Pope is a great reference. They ask to attend to important controversies in society with the capacity for dialogue, and they ask to speak and act with, uh, about all those you know, the, the concerns in which they live. Second, Christians who are the church ask uh, the church to be more authentic in their behavior toward others. That's exactly what already came to the Synod on Youth. That means they especially value the witness, uh, the service of the church to the poor and needy as essential point of followers of Christ. And uh, if we, we want to be a church with young people, just go with them to meet and serve the poor. And uh, two uh, other results, uh, they ask for integrous and courageous church in its structure, attitudes, and way of proceeding. And then for results, what they want, and I come back to uh, their main call, that is the way to envision a synodal church. A synodal church is a relational church and an inclusive church. And young people, they ask the church to facilitate a personal and community relationship with God. They don't ask the church to be, well, they like to come in a beautiful place, but they want the church to help them to build to foster, to experience a personal relationship with God and to live the church as a community of uh, followers of Christ or, uh, as brother and sister. So there is really a call to strengthen the participation of youth and women in the church. And in this document, there is an important part I uh, invite you to read it, if you haven't read it yet, uh, called Rethinking Women's Participation, and I quote, a critical and urgent area in this regard concerns the role of women. From all continents comes an appeal for Catholic women to be valued first and foremost as battered and equal members of the people of God. In every area of their lives, women ask the church to be their ally. So that's uh, where we are. Uh, the synodal process highlight more and more this urgent call for a more full and equal participation of women. And we can see that the synodal process, in a way, is like a path of recognition for youth and uh, women. And it was also, and that's my conclusion, <laughs> uh, during the Continental Synodal Assembly, there was a very strong focus on women and youth. So when the church is doing a synodal process, listening to everybody, one of the most important topics that came are youth and women. And I could quote uh, many things, but uh, I really want to, to conclude by an invitation to uh, continue the journey. And all of us, each of us, we have a role to play. 
because to become a synodal church, it's really nobody alone. <laughs> Uh, it's all together at all levels of the church, and we are called to discern what we can do to journey better with young people, women, and all the people of God. Uh, because a, a, a synodal church is a church with uh, everybody. That means, as Pope Francis said at the opening of the synod, that we are called to move, not occasionally, but structurally towards a synodal church. There is no need to create another church, but to create a different church. So that's also a call for all church institutions, and I would, that is really my last word, <laughs> uh, uh, highlight the importance also, it's also a call for Catholic universities uh, to discern how to become, because they are part of the church, how they can integrate the call to synodality into the ways they exercise their function and their mission. And one of the key issues for synodality that is also coming from everywhere through the synodal process is the need for formation. Formation for synodality, that means formation for listening, discernment in common, and one of the most important topic is a new style of leadership that is a servant and collaborative leadership so how our Catholic universities and many other church places are really training people and the new generation to teamwork, to collaborative leadership, to get rid of a pattern of competition, to enter a pattern of cooperation, journeying together uh, and listening to each other. So uh, I already thank you for your listening and hope now I will listen to you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Natalie, again. And as you say, it's time for us to listen, I think, to, to some of uh, our friends out here. One thing I just wanted to clarify um, on this, you know, all these synodal terms and, and listening church, there's a real process going on. I covered uh, my first synod when I was working at Vatican Radio was in 1987, which shows you how old I am. And it was a synod on the laity. And as I asked a woman, in, in, as I was interviewing a woman in uh, St. Peter Square about it, and she said, I think we need to talk about ladies. And I said, it's actually laity. And I, she said, oh, I get that. But that can, that's a warning about all the church language that we use, I think, that can be so off-putting to people. But these meetings, these global meetings of bishops, you have one on the laity. When I was there, you'd have one on a, on a, a different topic. This process now is very different, which you are engaged in. We're doing these listening sessions. I, I hope that some of you have done them in your parishes and the diocese. Explain how it, how it started in 2021 with to, to do listening sessions around each continent and then around each nation, around each continent. And then we're moving towards October when we have the synod on synodality uh, in, in, um, in the Vatican, correct? And that's part of a two year process. Yes, uh, I think what is very important is to understand that uh, what has changed, especially with Pope Francis, is that the Synod is no longer just an event or just something for bishops. Mm -hmm. It's a process and it's for everybody. And we can uh, really realize that the first time in all the history of the Church, that a synod is convoked for all, everybody, all the church. So it has been opened, uh, as I said, in October 21 by Pope Francis, and we had a beautiful opening uh, celebration and time. But the week after, in all dioceses all over the world, 
with this first phase that is already the synod. And the beginning of the preparatory document is the church, the old church is convoked in synod. So it's not just an assembly in Rome in October 23 and then a second uh, in October 24. It's all this process in which all of us are called to be involved. And so we had this first phase at the diocesan level, invited uh, the diocese to organize listening sessions, not only in parishes, but in many different kinds of, uh, so it, because the church is also uh, Catholic charities, uh, Catholic universities, schools. So some have done wonderful processes, including listening to the prisoners, uh, through the chaplaincy or the kids or people in a nursing home. They have been, uh, but this listening has been synthesized at the level of the diocese and all the diocesan synthesis has been synthesized at the level, at the national level. And from that, we received the synthesis from all over the world. That was very beautiful to read the, the life of the communities from all over the world, and we have drafted this document. But I come to my point because it's not only just a process uh, from the grassroots down top. This document has been uh, has tried to name, to echo the listening of the people of God all over the world and to give back to each local churches what we have listened to and to ask them to uh, read, to see uh, what is missing or what is already reflecting what they have said. So we need to think about the synodal process with the vision of circularity. And this time of the continental stage is to deepen the listening and the dialogue. And so then with what will come from all continents, and that's the first time we have this continental stage, we will draft the working document for the assembly in Rome in October. But then those who participate to the, the assembly in Rome will go back to the diocese. So, you know, it's this dialogue between all levels of the church and especially the local churches, we can say, and the universal church, because the vision of a synodal church is a church of local churches, a communion of, of local communities, we can say. And it's like you, you said uh, when we were talking earlier, it's almost like Vatican II. Not only you said it's uh, Orman Rush, that it's a continuation or it's in a nutshell, but you pointed out that Vatican II was four sessions and they would go home afterwards and they would talk to their people and they would hear from the people in the pews. Yes, in a way, uh, and that was very strong at the Synodal News, so I think that maybe in 20 or 30 years we will reread what has happened and the historian will do their work and we'll see how um, maybe the Synodal News had, had been one of the turning points because the, the, really the young people have spoken up and they have played a very important role through all the Synodal on News. But I was very struck and moved, and not only me, all the, the members of the Synod on Youth, we could really feel the spirit of Vatican II. And the image that came to speak about our experience during this month of October 2018 uh, at the, the Assembly of the Synod on Youth was we have experienced a new Pentecost. And that's what was said at the, at the council. And, um, and I have really experienced, you know, the church that we dream, in which everybody is listened to, can contribute, in which we are really all together, journeying with a spirit of collaboration, discerning together. And maybe, and I, I, I finish with what you say. 
you know, what the Council Fathers have experienced at the Second Vatican Council, so the, between 60, 1962 and 1965, four sessions, they came to Rome, they go back to their diocese, and that was the first time we had such a, a World Council. Uh, the spirit of collegiality, it was so powerful for them that they have asked to continue, and in fact, the, the institution of the Synod of Bishop is a way to continue uh, what the Council Fathers have experienced. But what I realize now with this Synod, maybe, is that what we are experiencing when really we listen to, we listen together, and all the feedbacks are when we do this synodal journey with the methodology we have proposed called spiritual conversation, it brings joy, hope, more understanding, more communion. So what the Council Fathers have experienced, you know, maybe now all of us who can have the chance to participate to a discerning process like this synodal process, we experience something of that. Yeah. Yeah, Andy, I just want to get uh, who's got the microphone? Um, thank you. Thanks, Mary Pat. Hello, Sister Natalie, thank you for coming. Um, I'm Mary Pat Fox, I'm president of Voice of the Faithful. We've held uh, a number of what we call mini synods and produced a document that we sent to the Vatican. We received a response. We've been very pleased with all of that. But our biggest concern is that here in the US, we're fragmented and there are many bishops who are not participating. We read the Continental Document and the Continental Document gave us great hope because people all around the world are concerned about women. People all around the world are concerned about homilies. There's so many different things that we all shared. But we're, the question I really have for you is, is this fracture that we have here, is this around the world as well? Or is this a unique US problem where we have a significant cadre of bishops who did not participate, who whatever they sent to Rome had nothing to do with what their people said, because they invited no one to participate. Good question. I, I think, uh, you know, and when you see the situation and the reality of the church all over the world, it's very diverse because the church is always, the a local church is always also shaped by the culture, the society, uh, the context. And, uh, you know, maybe the most important is to really see and, and live this synodal process. It's a, it's a process of conversion, personal conversion and communal conversion. And in each kind of organization, when you have a call for change, you have fears and resistance. And those who, who work in companies or in the corporate world knows that and you, now you have a uh, consultant for change uh, management. Or, so uh, I want to highlight that uh, the fact, not only bishops, it can sometimes be lady or that not everybody is enthusiastic or you know, it's, it's a reality. But it's true that in some countries, you know, when the Pope is asking to do something, they do it. <laughs> and uh, I have seen in, in some bishops' conference, really, everybody uh, has been involved. They have so it really depends on, on the situation, on the, on the countries. But I want to highlight that in the United States, at least for me, it's a wonderful, uh, you know, because it's step by step. Uh, you can't just in two days or three years become a perfect synodal church. You begin, the starting point of synodality is the situation, the concreteness, the people as they are. 
And we are called to be church all together with all our diversities, and not just to build a, a church in which you know half of the people will be left uh, aside. So it's true that we can see that in United States, it's not only in United States, it can happen in other local churches, especially those who are very much polarized also sometimes, mm. but it's not everywhere. And, uh, but at the end, you know, uh, what I see, and in the United States, I remember one year ago in February 22, only 50% of the dioceses in the United States were involved, were already on board doing. At the end, almost, I think it's more than 99% of the dioceses have sent a synodal synthesis. Maybe not with the perfect process everywhere, but at least they have, they have been involved. And what is the most important, if you can just take away one thing, <laughs> is that uh, it's an ongoing process, it's not finished, and it's not because we have sent a document that, uh, no, we have to continue <laughs> uh, to implement synodality uh, everywhere. And we, for many things, we don't need to wait for an assembly in Rome. To have, a, uh, to, to have a good pastoral council <laughs> that is uh, working. Or, uh, so this synod is at the service of a long-term process mm -hmm. and the synodal conversion of the church, that is also for the reform of the church, you know, it will take uh, one generation. Usually the, the historian in the church told us that to receive and implement a council, it's at least 100 years or 150 years. Of course, we are now in a society very much focused on short term. We like results, efficiency, and for what I know in the United States. <laughs> but the time of the church of the spirit uh, requires that we also enter in a long term uh, view. Well, it, um, let me ask the most uncomfortable question. Pope Francis is 86 years old. Do you think, you know, if he leaves this, when he leaves the scene, is this something that will continue? Is this process reversible or not? Well, you know, uh, I can't uh, already write the future, but I'm very confident because if as I have tried to highlight. Synodality is not just Pope Francis' uh, call. It's, we are retrieving synodality as a fruit of the Second Vatican Council, but in fact, it was really the style of the early church. Mm -hmm. And if you read one of the best uh, historians of councils and synod, who is a great American Jesuit who died uh, a few months ago, John O'Malley, mm -hmm. uh, he really highlights that. The style of the early church was synodal and the governance was collegial. So, Synodality is not just, uh, you know, uh, something that Pope Francis like. It's a constitutive dimension of the church that was more expressed in the early church. For many historical reasons, we have uh, a little bit uh, emphasized during many, many centuries the hierarchical dimension of the church. And now we are called to retrieve and to foster uh, the synodal dimension of the church. But there is no synodality without primacy and no primacy of service of residence without synodality. Mm -hmm. So I'm very confident because if we really believe that the church is the church of God, <laughs> Uh, body of Christ, temple of the spirit, P 
people of God, you know, what we are living and called to do for synodality is a long ecclesial discernment uh, and also the council and all the, the reception of the council, especially through. And it's the will of, we, the church has discerned that it is the will of God for the church of the third millennium. So I think, the, and many, many through this synod, and especially uh, I have heard that at the Continental Assembly, many says there is no way uh, backward. It's, we have to continue. And all the bishops who have been part, but not only the bishops, the laity who have experienced and be part of that, they already say we are committed to continue and to implement synodality. You can read that in all the final document of the Continental Assemblies that are beginning to be published. Every, uh, we have to receive them before Friday. So uh, each day there is one who is published, that is published. Other questions over here? One and two, and then one, two, three. Thank you very much, Sister Natalie. My accent's Australian, and I did hear you in Melbourne. Uh, one of the things that bothers my group and the people in Australia particularly is that this is a synodality for everyone. Uh, the synodality is for everyone. The synod is for everyone, but it seems to be just bishops with very few lay people. And we know that, that the coffee conversations, the conversations in the corridors, really make the difference in big meetings. Is there any move for more of the laity and more of religious to be um, present at the Synod? Well, as I said, they have been very much present and involved because, you know, uh, the Synod is not just this assembly in Rome in October. It's all this process and the majority of those who have been involved have been the lay people, many sisters, religious. For the first time, those continental assemblies, they were ecclesial assemblies with participation of a majority in many cases, or at least a good number of lay people uh, and, and, and sisters. Uh, and many have said it was the first time it was not at the continental level a meeting with bishops, but a meeting with bishops, uh, lay people, priests, young people, women, sisters, and the fruits are very good. And we, are, uh, we can't, as I say, we can't go. <laughs> so the assembly will be mainly with bishops, but there will be a good number of other people you know, at, so it's at all levels. The, and maybe also I want to highlight, because that's also a very important part, you know, for instance, to draft this document, uh, we settled a group of experts, theologians from all continents. We met 12 days uh, in October near Rome, in Frascati, doing a process of discernment, prayer, uh, cross-reading of all the synthesis and drafting this document with uh, a good number of uh, women. And uh, when you think back about Vatican II, the theologians had a very important role, but they were all priests. And uh, so it's in all our commissions, we have uh, women, lay people, uh, so at all levels, it's not only the visible part, but, uh, and the fact also what I have highlighted that the diocesan team or the drafting team for the diocese, the continental, they, they, they were teamed with uh, also lay people uh, and not only priests or bishops. So, you know, it will continue to unfold. You will also, uh, I think it's important that you'll have a, a vote in the next synod as a, a woman and a lay person, which I think is, is new. I mean, can, it was constituted after the Second Vatican Council as a synod of bishops. Will it continue to be that in the future or will it just be a synod? 
So the first thing I, I, I want to say is maybe some of you were not aware of that. So when the Synod of Bishop was instituted by Paul VI during the fourth session of the Second Vatican Council, so it was called the Synod of Bishops. Then after a few years, they settled a general secretariat of the Synod of Bishops to organize the Synod and it became a permanent staff because uh, the idea of the Synod of Bishop is to continue and to represent all the bishops. <laughs> but through the experience of the Synod and the transformation, and especially with Pope Francis, he has involved in the preparation, the consultation, many, many of them. So we have understood, and now we are in a state, that highlight that there is no collegiality or uh, ministry of the bishops, even of the Pope, without inserting this within the synodality with all the people of God and the, the broader listening. So one of the big change is that with the new constitution of the Roman Curia, because not uh, formally the, the, our secretariat for the Synod is not part of the Roman yes. Curia. We, we are, you know, we relate in a way to all the bishops. So we have a council of bishops. So tomorrow morning I have this council online mm. and we directly refer to, uh, to the Pope who is our president. But in this new constitution for the Roman Curia with two key that are given for the reform of the Curia, its mission and synodality, it is written that all the dicasteries at the Vatican, they have to collaborate with the general secretariat of the synod. Hmm. So now we are no longer the general secretariat of the synod of bishop, but the general secretariat of the synod to highlight that uh, it's broader than just synod of bishops, and we have to promote and to live synodality through many different ways. And an assembly of a synod of bishops is just one. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an important change. Uh, and on the question of the vote, with my position when I was appointed as undersecretary, before it has always been a bishop, and this position gave uh, the, the right of vote because the undersecretaries, like the general secretary, are members of uh, the assembly of the Synod of Bishops. But now what is very important, two weeks ago in an interview, Pope Francis said that all the members of the Synod, of the assembly in Rome, all the members, of course many bishops, but possibly there will be others, will have the right of vote, men and women. Pope Francis has stated so Everybody that, in the room. Yeah. So everybody that will be member of the Synod, of the Assembly in Rome in October, will have the right of vote. Wow. Let's hear from... So yeah. stay tuned and uh, follow <laughs> the next steps. <laughs> this young man here. Yes. Sister, thanks again for coming. Um, my name is James Haddad. I'm just a, just a Fordham student. But I wanted to ask you, with all the information that you've seen uh, coming in from all the different synods across the world, are there some big changes that you foresee? I know you said it would take a while to see how this synod may play out. But one thing I know that people talk about often is the idea of women deacons. Are these things that, are, you, see, or that you see possibly coming into play in the future? Well, you know, I can't say what will come <laughs> because, you know, the, really the most important for a synod is to, so it's a discernment in common through this process of listening, but it is to build a consensus. At the end of the council, well, not at the end because some documents were voted before, but all the documents of the Second Vatican Council were voted by almost 99% uh, or 100%. 
my experience at the Synod on Young People, you know, when at the end, when we vote, we have already reached a consensus. So that's why, you know, I don't say that the vote is not important, but the, the, really the goal is to seek the truth together, to discern and to reach a consensus. And you can refer to the first council, that is a kind of paradigmatic image for all synod and council, the Council of Jerusalem, uh, Act of the Apostle, chapter 15. There is a big conflict in the communities. They don't have the same views on uh, those who are becoming, uh, following Christ, who are not Jews. Do they have to be circumcised or not? Big? What do they do? They gather, they pray together, they discern, and at the end, it is written, the Holy Spirit and us have decided that. So, we have to be aware, we kind of have idea, and uh, in some countries, there is a big uh, focus on the importance of uh, women uh, deacons, there is this common call for more women participation, but the way to answer this call, there is not an unanimous response. So for what has to be decided at the universal global level, with people coming from so many, so many different local churches, different contexts, culture and diversity, uh, it, it takes time to, to build a consensus. Mm. And the first, mm. really, what, you know, and to build a consensus, you need first to really learn to journey together, to listen to each other, to discern. So I can't say what will come, but what I can say is that, and that gives me a lot of hope, and it's very moving, through everything I have uh, observed, all the feedbacks, all my travels, I already contemplate the work of the Holy Spirit and I see already many changes at the grassroots. And that's also the most important. So I think it will continue, there will be some changes. But I have a couple see. back here, Jim Maraki, and then behind you, and then um, and then up here. Hi, thank you for your talk. I'm Jim Maraki. I'm a Jesuit, and I'm the associate pastor at St. Francis Xavier Parish downtown. Uh, I hate to be the buzzkill in the room, um, <laughs> but I want to ask a question about the tensions between this wonderful process of listening and discerning. It's very liminal. Uh, the tensions between that and the everyday operation of the church, uh, which is um, it's a male hierarchical system from priest to pastor to bishop to pope. And I love what we're trying to do, but do you really believe that we're going to get somewhere? Um, I mean, certainly I know that there are differences around the world as to what issues are most important, but questions of doctrine are being raised. Who's welcome to the sacraments? Who's welcome to orders? Who's welcome to marriage and so forth, communion? Um, are, we, are we setting ourselves up for disappointment? Uh, I, I don't want to take away from your, your sense of hope, but you know, when decisions are made, when the budgets are determined by an exclusively male hierarchical church, will women, will youth really have a voice and an impact that, that changes things? Uh, thank you for your question. You know, really, one thing we are really learning through this synodal process, when you want to listen to everybody, you don't have one view. <laughs> And uh, so it, we need to face the tensions. And that's really what we are learning. And, and to face and cope with the tension in a generative way. And maybe what is new, because for many reasons, sometimes in the church, we had a tendency to put under the table <laughs> the tensions or to... So we have this beautiful ecclesiology 
of the Second Vatican Council, especially with Lumen Gentium, you know, uh, that we try <laughs> with synodality to implement and to live since 60 years. But we inherit from 1,500 years of a mindset, a vision, a way to be church, that is exactly what you said, very hierarchical, clerical, male-dominated. The church of the first millennium, as I said, was synodal. So we are in a time of transition. We still, there are already many places in the church that are already very synodal. Uh, and you are Jesuit, I can share about my experience in France. We have a beautiful experience now since more than 30, 40 years of what we call the Ignatian family, really of collaboration, uh, doing many things together, uh, Jesuits, Ignatian sisters, lay people from CLC or other with a spirit of collaboration, partnership. And now when I uh, reflect on my experience, uh, I have learned in a way the Synodal Church with this, uh, especially we have an Ignatian Youth Network. So there are places like that. And I could quote many others, but it's true. Because the church is not only the parishes or the dioceses, but we still need, and it's not easy, and I can tell you, and I think many of you, you can say, when uh, it's a long process with up and down, desolation, consolation, resistance, and, uh, and to do this synodal pass, it's first about a change of mindset, change of culture, and it takes a lot of time, and also about some reform uh, of structure. Some have already, it, it's open. It, it's open, some people are working in our commissions about the canon law, uh, you know. But it's not enough to have the structure if people have not changed uh, their mindset. And the church is in the society, and even in the United States, even in France, you know, with the Me Too movement or other, you can see that we have not finished uh, to get rid of a patriarchal, male-dominated uh, culture. That's the reality. Speaking of which, a young woman back here. Uh, Dr. Natalie, thank you for joining us, taking time to join us this evening. My name is Claire Mukolwe galazzini long name. I'm an alumni from Fordham University and a parishioner here at St. Paul Church of St. Paul the Apostle. I am from Zambia, Africa, and I'm just curious to find out, especially because my mother served on the board of the World Union of Catholic Women representing Africa, and I know one of the women that you were appointed with, um, with Pope Francis, was the president of the World Union of Catholic Women. I'm just curious, since you uh, touched on the fact that you, you went to Africa during one of your travels, is there one big takeaway that you can share with us that can be used as a learning point from Africa to the, to the church as a whole globally? Thank you. Yes, thank you for raising this question. Uh, in fact, what is very interesting when we speak about synodality in Africa, immediately, many, many people, lay people, bishops, priests, they refer to uh, this notion that came from the two synods on bishop of, on Africa, many of you remember them, and they speak about the church as family of God. That's a way to envision church in Africa. And what is very interesting in Africa, and that was at the Continental Assembly in Addis Abeba, Ethiopia, immediately they connect synodality with the African culture and the African values, the experience, as I say, of the family, but also what they call, there are many different ways to call that, but uh, the Ubuntu philosophy or anthropology, I am because you are. 
So in Africa, in the, in the culture of Africa, there is a sense that nobody exists uh, as just an isolated uh, person. It's the, the, the African values uh, highlight the importance of relations, family, the community. So that's a big takeaway that we can learn, especially in our Western countries, where we put such an emphasis on the individual person. Sometimes we are very much ego-centered and we have lost a sense of community uh, sometimes I say to explain synodality in a nutshell, it's to pass from the I to the earth. It's to retrieve the ecclesial we. We don't live alone. We are all part, as Pope Francis says, of the human family. And so what, I, what is beautiful, you know, in each culture, you have seeds of the gospel and you have seeds of synodality, but you have also elements of the culture that are obstacles to synodality. And in Africa, for instance, and also Asia, they have very much highlighted that one of the main obstacles for synodality is tribalism. Uh, so, in each culture, we have good seeds to highlight and to share with others, but we have also to discover uh, the elements to be converted that are obstacles for synodality. Let's have uh, one question here. I think our last question. We'll also be breaking. We'll have um, wine and cheese at the, at the end, and we can discuss this some more as well. Thank you very much, Sister Natalie and David. Um, I was curious about the new preparatory commission that Cardinal Gretsch uh, just appointed. Um, I want to know their role. It sounds like they're going to actually revise, perhaps, the continental document. That's my first question. The second is, um, it only has uh, one woman. Um, she sounds like a wonderful person, but one woman and six men, and I would like should we be concerned about that? Will that weed out all, because I, when I read the Continental document, I was amazed to see like 80, 90% of people clamoring for women deacons, for example. So I just want to be sure that the men are aware of that and should we be concerned that there's only one woman on that count, commission, thanks. And which commission is this? Um, it's the Preparatory Commission. It was just announced March 15th uh -huh. by Cardinal Gretsch. Uh -huh. um, they met with Pope Francis um, to do the preparatory document. Right, they're going to prepare the documents for the Discussion. October meeting. So I didn't know if it was just, are they going to divide up the continental document and distribute it to the bishops, or are they actually going to edit uh, out text? Hmm. Um, so, so first, to, to say how the preparation, the, what we say, instrumentum laboris, so the working document for the assembly uh, in October, how it will be prepared. Uh, so by the end of this week, we will receive the final document of the seven uh, continental assemblies. So we will receive seven final documents. And uh, a good number of us uh, like Cardinal Gregg, Cardinal Ulrich, the other undersecretary, uh, but also some who were part of the task force for the Continental Meeting, because the choice of Cardinal Gregg is to involve different kind of commissions or task force for each step of the Synod. And uh, so this preparatory uh, commission is a new commission that is more focused directly uh, on the preparation of the assembly in October. They won't be alone to draft the uh, instrumentum laboris for October. Uh, the, so it's not public, so I can't say now who will be exactly in this team, but there will be more than one woman. Uh, 
even if they have an important role as preparatory commission, but uh, it will be a larger group. So, um, this commission, as I said, is, is uh, ready at, uh, to help directly to prepare the assembly, uh, the assembly in October. Uh, and it's, you know, a, a new step now. Uh, but what is important is that the final document of each assembly is, you know, and as I said, the document it's important, but it's, it's, the synod is, is much more than a question of documents. And until now, in each document of the synod, there have been women involved with, with all those. You know, but it's, uh, it, it, it's also called us, you know, to, until now, what we have, to, yes, also to be confident that the spirit is leading us and we hope to continue to serve uh, what the spirit is calling us to do. Mm. Yeah, in some, in some sense, I think there's just shock that there are things moving in Rome and in the Vatican um, in ways that we never thought they would. I think there's skepticism, even cynicism among so, so many Catholics that, and surprise that things are happening in Rome that we, that aren't even happening here. Yeah, may, may I just, sure. uh, in conclusion also, just to highlight also very important uh, dimension of the Synod that will um, be particularly visible at the opening of the Synod, maybe you have read about it, there is a strong ecumenical dimension for the Synod because Synodality is also uh, uh, an important issue <laughs> Uh, I would say, in ecumenical relationship. And we can also learn synodality from other churches, other Christian denominations, I would say. And in a way, as Pope Francis has highlighted, ecumenism is going hand in hand with synodality. Because synodality is not just about a way to be church, a Catholic church at intra it goes hand in hand with a way to be church in dialogue with people from other faiths, with the society, with, uh, it's a way to be church in the world. So to implement synodality, we need to have also in mind uh, the roadmap of Laudato Si, of Fratelli Tutti. It's the style of the church in the world in dialogue of the church. So, uh, at the opening of the Synod, we will begin with a ecumenical vigil of prayer on September 30 on uh, St. Peter's Square, presided uh, by Pope Francis, but he will invite all the other head of churches, Orthodox, Anglican, uh, Protest all kind of Protestant, and we are preparing that with uh, the Dicastery for Christian Unity, Dicastery for Laity, the Tese community, the, they are very much involved, and many delegates from other churches. And among them, women pastor, uh, even some uh, women bishop in some churches, uh, all kind of delegates, young. Um, and that would be a very strong sign to highlight that first the Synod is rooted into prayer and also it's about this, uh, like the, the council, that was an ecumenical mm -hmm. council, uh, there will be also uh, the presence, and it has been at all levels, the presence of fraternal delegates from other churches. So you are welcome to Rome, uh, if you want, on September 30 for this gathering of the people of God, all the people of God, or you can organize a prayer like uh, connected to Rome in, uh, in each diocese or parishes. You spoiled the surprise. Our next CRC event will be in Rome. Yes, exactly. <laughs> The one thing about Sister Natalie that did not come out, there are many wonderful things about her and her work and her life, is that she's a, uh, a sailor. She loves sailing. She has a skipper's 
license, which I never knew until today. So um, I feel very confident that um, we have someone with a skipper's license um, navigating us, <laughs> the bark of St. Peter's, through what really is a remarkable time. I was there for a bit of the youth synod, and I've never seen anything like it uh, in, a, in, a, in a room full of bishops. But again, you've given us such a great highlight, a picture of this moment in what is a longer journey. And I think that's what a real, my real takeaway is. It is a journey and you brought us more consolation than desolation and we appreciate that. And I think we should have you back maybe next year when we have taken another step on the journey. Please join me in, well, in thanking Mr. Natalie. Thank you to the Russo family for sponsoring this lecture series and we look forward to seeing you at the next CRC event. Thank you. Thank you.